Thank you for downloading the latest episode of Positively Trek. We could not do this podcast without the support of our Patreon supporters, including Carl Morris, Joyce Marin, and Jim Stoffel. If you'd like to support the podcast, please go to patreon.com slash positively trek. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, shout outs, associate producer credits, and more. Thank you so much for your support. And with that, let's get on with the show. <laughs> hey man, I remember you back at the academy. A stack of books with legs. The first thing I ever heard from an upperclassman was, Watch out for Lieutenant Kirk. In his class, you either think or sink. <laughs> that wasn't that bad, was it? If I hadn't aimed that little blonde lab technician at you. You what? You, you planned that? Well, you wanted me to think. I outlined her whole campaign for her. I almost married her. I've been waiting for this day for probably six years. Six years I've been waiting to do this episode that we're about to do right now. Oh, Hi, wow. I'm Bruce Gibson. Yeah, here on Positively Track. This is Dan Gunther, who's just so wild that I've been waiting all this time for this. Yeah, no kidding. I've got like Phil Collins in my head now. I've been waiting for this moment all of my life. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe Phil feels the same way I do about this. I'm just episode. waiting for that killer drum solo. That's what I'm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. Yeah. So, okay. Here on the book club, we're doing the novel Enterprise, The First Adventure. And if I recall, because I for some reason forgot to bring my copy with me right now, but I think it was published in 1986. Yes. Uh, My copy is on the other side of the room because I am similarly unprepared, but yes, I believe that's correct. (laughs) And it was written by Vonda Mm McIntyre, who's written many Star Trek novels, including some of the novelizations of the movies. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason I've been excited about this is because ever since I started podcasting about Star Trek books, I kept thinking at some point I want to get to this book because this is the first Star Trek novel I ever read. I bought it back in 86. I didn't read it at the time. And then five years later, I was like, the Lost Years came out and I was like, oh, I want to read that. Well, I didn't even read the other Star Trek book I bought five years ago. I'm like, so I need to read that first before I read the Lost Years. And that's what started all of this. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's amazing. Yeah. I, I bought this a while ago from a used bookstore. It sat on my shelf for years. Uh, multiple times I've moved, it sat on my shelf. But uh, I've never read it, never read it until now. So I'm really excited to talk about it for sure. Well, and I'd like to talk about this because it was my first adventure into Star Trek novels, so appropriate enough with the title. But I always wanted to go back and reread this at some point, because now having read over 400, maybe I'm up to 500, I don't know, I need to do a count, of Star Trek novels that I've read, I just was curious, like, what would I think about this now? I remember at the time liking it, but I didn't necessarily love it, but I really enjoyed it. And so it's going to be interesting, as we talk through this, how I feel about it this go-round. Yeah, for sure. And and like I said, this is my first time reading it. So uh, I had, I don't know, an interesting reaction to it. I'm, I'm interested to talk it out with you because like many times when we talk about books, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about this novel overall. And I think this discussion will kind of uh, help me figure that out, if that makes sense. That makes sense. I'm going to say upfront right now that I think I feel about the same way about it this time as I did back then, but maybe just a little less. Hmm. And I'll, I'll reveal why. Well, I, actually, I'll tell you why. I don't know anything specific, but I feel back then I didn't know Star Trek as well as I do now. So there was times that I felt there was like a couple of missed opportunities maybe to do something. So, and But back then I didn't think of that, you know? Right. So, but it's about the same. I would probably knock it down like a point one. <laughs> from what I probably thought back then. Okay. But we might as well get into it, right? Absolutely. Let's do it. So, okay. It starts off, there's this prologue where Kirk has a nightmare about this battle he was involved in where he, I guess he was in command of this starship, the Lydia Sutherland. I wasn't too clear if he was the captain of it or not. 
but he was definitely leading a team. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was the captain. And I think I may be misremembering, but I think this is what uh, Christopher Bennett went with for his novel as well. Right? That re- one that came out recently. Oh my gosh, I hadn't thought about that. I think you might be right. I think he at least mentioned, yeah, the Lydia Sutherland. Well, and yeah, and I, I yeah, I had forgotten about that. But and also, I, I think it was pretty clear that Gary Mitchell was the first officer for Kirk on this ship too. And he was greatly injured. So we start off this book with Kirk kind of seeing Gary Mitchell is injured and feels bad and hopes he recovers soon because Kirk is taking command of a new starship or his not a new starship, but for him, it's a new starship, his new command of the Enterprise. And Gary Mitchell is supposed to be his first officer, Mm -hmm. not Spock, but Gary Mitchell. But Spock's still there because he served under Pike and Spock will remain a science officer. But also, as we see in the story, Kirk has a mini reunion with Carol Marcus, which plays out really interesting, too. So, Dan, what did you think about the setup of Kirk with the whole Gary Mitchell and Carol Marcus story pieces? I found that really interesting because we hardly ever see any of Kirk's career before the Enterprise. And I think I mentioned the Christopher L. Bennett novel that came out earlier this year. I think that might be the only other time that I can recall them really talking about his career right before the Enterprise. We talk a little bit in the series about his time as a lieutenant and that kind of thing. But yeah, seeing his life before he takes command and the interpersonal relationships, I liked that Carol Marcus was included because as we find out later, of course, that's such a big part of his life. And we have David Marcus, his son, of course, the result of that. And the whole Gary Mitchell thing, I kind of, you know, Gary Mitchell is sidelined for most of the novel because, well, for almost all of the novel because he's been injured here. Uh, I I was kind of expecting a little bit more of an exploration of that relationship, and I thought maybe we'd see them in action together a little bit, but that never comes to pass. So it was it was an interesting way to kind of say like, yeah, these are important people in Kirk's life. But what we're going to do with this is focus on Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. We're going to show you that that main triumvirate that defines the original series. And so in one way, I was like, oh, I'm glad they're included. But in another way, I kind of wish they had more of a part in the story. I'm not too disappointed with it, but I think that goes back to what I was saying earlier, that now that I know more about Star Trek reading this book now, I think as a Star Trek fan and how much I do understand about the canon of Star Trek that I would have liked to have seen what you were just describing. But at the same time, I would understand that this is the first book and even people like me back then who weren't maybe huge into Star Trek and didn't know all the nuances of Star Trek would probably have been disappointed that's not Kirk, Spock, and McCoy on their first mission. So I can see where they, you know, remove Gary Mitchell from the story by having him injured. And also Dr. Piper, who was Mm -hmm. the chief medical officer that we saw in the second pilot to Star Trek. But he's mentioned about possibly bringing him on uh, if they can't get McCoy in time. So I thought it was interesting that they did call out to those, but it made me wonder at the end of the book, well, how did Piper and Gary Mitchell get back? Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things where I feel like the, the author was really trying to give it that original series flavor. The one that we know from the Corbo might maneuver on kind of thing and not trying to focus on the where no man has gone before status quo, because yeah, there are a lot of things here that uh, would, you know, you, might consider don't jive really with what we see with the pilot episodes. So you mentioned the Piper McCoy thing. Presumably at some point McCoy takes a leave of absence or something and and Piper comes back to temporarily fill in the role. Like that's pretty easily explained. There's other things, however, that are a little bit harder to explain. So for example, in that pilot episode, we never saw Uhura. We never saw Rand. We certainly never saw Chekhov. Uh, they kind of explain that by saying like, oh, he's a lower decks officer or he's the night shift guy kind of thing. So usually we wouldn't see him. But the other thing is, and this bothered me more than it should have, but Sulu was not the helmsman when he was first aboard the Enterprise. He was a physicist. He was in the science department. So it seems, you know, they they just they want him at the helm because that's what Sulu does. So but there's no explanation given there whatsoever, which I, I don't know. It shouldn't be a huge deal, but it did bug me a bit. 
Yeah, I wondered that too, because again, I was expecting maybe by the end of the novel, we find out why he's not the helmsman anymore. Mm-hmm. I did you keep know? waiting for that, yeah. Because it was kind of leading in some ways, like it could go towards that, because let's just quickly touch on Sulu be- right now, because he was actually assigned to the USS Airfin, and all of a sudden, he's like on his shore leave or whatever, and he's waiting until he gets you know, assigned to go to the ship. And then all of a sudden he gets this immediate communication that he has to board the enterprise that he has been reassigned to the enterprise as helmsman. And he's like, I don't want the enterprise. Like, what is this? Like, I'm not even ready. I'm supposed to go on this other ship. Mm -hmm. So he gets the enterprise not wanting to be there. And he complains to Spock about it. And, you know, Spock is basically like, well, you're here. I mean, you'd have to take it up with the captain, but this is your assignment. And Sulu throughout the book is like, how do I approach the captain about this? How do I tell him this is a mistake? But by the time we get to the end of the book, it's concluded that, well, Sulu kind of likes this captain and this crew, so he's going to stay. But I expect at that point that he was like, well, but I still don't want to be the helmsman. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. The other thing with regards to that, the USS Airfin, Correct me if I'm wrong, that ship shows up in the Entropy Effect by Vonda and McIntyre as well, and Sulu actually transfers to that ship for a little while, right? With Captain Hunter, I believe? Yes, yes. That's interesting you mentioned that, because Captain Hunter is brought up several times in Vonda's books. I remember that even in the novelization of The Wrath of Khan. Right, yeah. It's mentioned that, or maybe it's The Search for Spock. It's one of those, because Sulu's getting ready to take on the Excelsior and Captain Hunter helped recommend him for that position. And he was, you know, and he it established he had a history of serving under Captain Hunter. Yeah, I love that. That kind of mini Vondaverse or McIntyre verse. I don't know that, that these are kind of inter- interconnected a bit. I do enjoy that. But I was a little confused, too, because I, I didn't really understand why Kirk had requested Sulu. I, did I miss something? Because... I kept waiting to see why Kirk specifically asked for Sulu to be the helmsman when Sulu, A, never served with Kirk, and B, didn't have experience piloting a Constitution-class starship. I wondered that myself, and I kind of kept waiting for that. I don't know why he was transferred exactly. Like That never even really was explained. It was just like, oh, your new orders are here. Uh, and, And like you said, Kirk requested him, I guess. But yeah, there's no real explanation as to why that happened or, or you know, what that particular desire to have Sulu aboard was. So I, yeah, I kept waiting for that as well. Yeah. So yeah, those are little missed opportunities there. I really would have liked to have known that. I kept waiting for it and it just <laughs> never came. I guess maybe he was known as being a great pilot, but he just had never piloted this type of ship and Kirk didn't care, just knew that he had this great reputation. I guess. I mean, that's the only reason I could come up with. Mm -hmm. I did love the little bit of parallels. And I I wonder, I know that the producers of the Star Trek 2009 movie did read a number of novels and took ideas from. But when Sulu is piloting the Enterprise out of space dock, it really reminded me of the, uh, the scene in Star Trek 2009 when, did you leave the parking brake on? That whole thing. Like, he kind of overpowers the the maneuvering thrusters and wrenches the enter, the enterprise sideways kind of thing and everyone's like oh my god this helmsman doesn't know what he's doing it really reminded me of that bit from 2009 it did for me too i had the same thought i thought did they read this and pull this idea from this i, I bet I, they did i wouldn't doubt it yeah they have yeah. said they've read i think uh best destiny by diane yep. carey and prime directive i think they took ideas from both of those or yeah. maybe, yeah, I think that's right. Well, and they obviously saved Carol Marcus for the second movie, where in this, as we mentioned before, she shows up early in the prologue. And I thought the interaction between Kirk and Carol was interesting because they broke up, yet he's getting ready to leave on the Enterprise, and he realizes he still wants to be with her, and so he proposes to her. Mm-hmm. And I, she just turns him down flat, like, no. Yeah. <laughs> And I and I love that Kirk immediately is kind of like, yeah, that's probably for the best. <laughs> like he's kind of letting his feelings get in the way of his good sense, I guess. And he but he recognizes that too. He kind of realizes like, yeah, no. We broke up for reasons and that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it works. But now here's the part that I was 
a little disappointed about, as I said earlier, about little things like this. When Kirk goes to the Enterprise and they're having this like welcome party, the transfer of from Pike to Kirk, there's very little interaction between Pike and Kirk. Mm-hmm. I was really expecting something more. But I also think maybe I'm expecting that because we've gotten so much of Pike lately and we've had Pike in the Kelvin timeline movies being his mentor. So there was a good relationship between these two characters there. Yeah. And in this, it was basically just they. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but essentially you just kind of wave at each other. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's not much there. Yeah. Pike leaves pretty early. There's, there's some hints there that Pike really doesn't want to leave. He's being promoted out of this. And what we see of Pike is mostly kind of a bit of a bitter kind of jaded guy, pretty quiet, which, you know, fits pretty well with what we saw in the cage and the menagerie. So going from that to this, I'm like, okay, I can see that. It's a little harder if you factor in all of Anson Mount's performance and stuff. He's a little bit looser, but maybe at this time in his life, he's he's definitely uh, a little grumpier, I guess. But, you know, given the circumstances, understandable too. Yeah. And I think they said his age was in his, he was 15 years older than Kirk. Mm -hmm. Kirk is 30 or just turned 30. So yeah, that puts Pike mid forties. There's, I've read a lot of debate online of people trying to guess what Pike's age is because there's kind of some inconsistencies between the movies and discovery and the pilot and the menagerie. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The one line from the menagerie that just makes no sense when Commodore Mendez tells Kirk, he's about your age, Jim. (laughs) It's like, uh, did you mean he's about your age in the footage we're going to be watching later? Because that was 11 years ago and he looks older than Kirk then. So yeah, that would mean that 11 years ago, Pike was like 20 years old. Yeah. As captain of the enterprise. <laughs> so I think that was a bit of a, a f- mistaken line, but you know, or, yeah. or really you have to interpret it very weirdly, but yeah, there's a lot of inconsistencies when it comes to Pike's age and yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you in one part, in this section of the book that I really liked is how we find out Spock is first officer that Abro Naguchi has put Spock in the first officer role. And Kirk's like, well, no, I want Mitchell in that position. And the Admiral overrules him. And he's like, no, you know, Spock needs to be in there. It's the best balance between Mm -hmm. Kirk and Spock than it would be with Kirk and Gary Mitchell. And I like that because that helps to establish why we don't see Kirk's best friend being first officer on the show, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely. And again, you know, this is them wanting to get everybody in their proper positions and and tell that story of how these these officers got started, but yeah, it's interesting that while Kirk is being entrusted with this big uh, constitution class. Well, they keep calling it constellation class in the book, but we've we've retconned it later to be a constitution class. They trust him to be captain, but he's still a young captain, so it feels like the admiral kind of is still guiding things and maybe not completely trusting everything to the captain and micromanaging a little bit. But the Admiral has good instincts, obviously, as we'll see over the course of the original series, right? Like these two will become the best of friends and really balance each other out. So, you know, the the Admiral knows what he's doing, but to Kirk, it feels arbitrary and micromanaging at this point. There is a sense as we're talking through this where the characters are not always getting what they want. You Mm -hmm. know, Kirk wants the Enterprise, but he wants Mitchell as his first officer. Sulu doesn't want to be on the Enterprise. He wants to be on another ship. Uh, Spock wants to transfer off the Enterprise because he doesn't know how he feels about Kirk and also that he's heard Kirk say that he wants Mitchell, wanted Mitchell to be his first officer. So even Spock's looking to leave. Of course, McCoy's always grumbling about something, right? He just wants to be back on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, and then, you know, we've had uh, incidences where we see Scotty and Kirk arguing, you know, that Kirk doesn't feel like Scotty's listening to him and Scotty wants to do it his way. So they're all kind of, they don't just gel together immediately, which is good, right? It's mm-hmm. like they're, they don't know each other. They're filling each other out. They're having second thoughts. It just makes sense. So I appreciate that part of the book too. 
Yeah, I appreciated it. And I think at first I was like, "Why Th- this feels so weird. Why does this feel so weird? I I don't like how this is going, but it's because of how television was in the 60s and we never see the beginning, right? We see we get dropped in the middle of the adventures when this crew is a well-oiled machine all working together really well. But this novel really takes it in a different direction and says, like, at the very beginning, they're just getting to know each other. Kirk doesn't know what a mind meld is. He's arguing with Scotty all the time. And Scotty thinks this young pup shouldn't be in charge of his engines and his ship and all this stuff. So at first I was like, oh, I don't like this. This is so." And then I was like, wait, no, this is realistic. And this makes a lot of sense. I really appreciate what they're trying to do with the story here. Right, like uh, Spock and McCoy arguing. We see their very first argument, yes. which was kind of fun. It's <laughs> sick bay. Well, Spock's getting his physical and arguing about emotionalism, and Spock then storms out, <laughs> just annoyed with McCoy. Mm-hmm. And even comes back to try to apologize, but then doesn't, because I think McCoy was like too busy or something. Yeah, that was an interesting scene. I like where Spock is at this point, where he's... Not quite at the point that we see in the original series, but still has a bit of that emotionalism kind of coming up, but at the same time is like really can't figure out how to relate to these humans sometimes. And and I, I, I really liked Spock in this one. I think he's so confused, but also the smartest person in the room all the time. It's an interesting combination. Well, like when he's playing chess and Kirk walks by and he's like, oh, Mr. Spock, where are you doing? You know, who are you playing with? And Spock's playing with himself because, you know, there's nobody else good enough to play with him on the ship. And then Kirk's like, oh, I can, you know, move in for whatever you know, checkmate. And Spock challenges him to it. And then all of a sudden, yeah, Kirk wins. And Spock's like, oh, I have a worthy opponent now. Yeah, that's, uh, of course, linking right back to the pilot episode, too, with Kirk and uh, Spock playing chess and Kirk beating him handily. So it's it's interesting that Kirk is better than Spock at chess on occasion. Yeah, I did like that a lot. And then we also had Kirk's mother and brother on the ship for the ceremony. That didn't really do much for me. To me, it was like they were just kind of there, but I did enjoy that, like, they're kind of snapping at Kirk, like, you know, you're being rude and you're being a bit arrogant and you're not being understanding because we have this horse in the shuttlecraft bay that's, you know, got wings and, you know, (laughs) Kirk doesn't even know, like, what's this horse doing there? And, you know, comes to find out their mission is they're supposed to escort this vaudeville troop to different star bases for the next few months so they can perform. And it's like, really? That's my first mission as captain of the Enterprise is transporting a vaudeville troop around? <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting choice, uh, definitely, to include the vaudeville troop and stuff. Regarding his family being on board, I kind of felt the same way you did at first, where I was like, why are they really here? They're not adding a whole lot. We don't see them for too long. But then I realized that as we go along, they're they're kind of able to tell Kirk that he's being a bit of a jerk. And they're kind of the only people that are able to tell him that as well, because everyone else aboard, except the vaudeville troop, are his subordinates. So I kind of liked that, you know, his mom and brother are there to like kind of snap him back to reality a little bit sometimes. But they don't last on the ship very long. They They leave fairly quickly. Yeah, because the only other character would have been McCoy, which they could have brought McCoy in for that because Kirk and McCoy already had an established relationship. But it works to have the mother and the brother there, you know, because it's also almost like, you know, they're sending him off like to school, you know, like he's leaving Earth, he's leaving his family behind and it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. And it's also a bit of the awkwardness of the different worlds colliding a little bit, too, because we always see Kirk as the captain but we never see Kirk as the son or the brother. Yes. So it, it's interesting to see those worlds combine. And and I felt that awkwardness as well, because I've been in that situation where you have like different groups of friends or different aspects of your life that kind of come into contact with each other. And you're one person with this group and you're a different person with this other group. And you're like, now I don't know how to act. This is awkward. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now I'm thinking about Worf and his parents. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, before we go into the whole vaudeville troop thing, we were introduced early in the novel to this Klingon that has taken over a bird of prey, and her name is Karanin. 
And I have to say, when this started off, I really enjoyed the setup and this character because she comes in as a badass. This crew's like, who the hell do you think you are? And she just kind of takes over and she's like, this is now my ship and you're going to do what I tell you to do. And I, it felt very Klingon mm-hmm. and I just loved it. But I have to say up front, I was disappointed as it went along because we don't get that much of her. And she just was like the typical villain that's just out for herself or something. Like, yeah, I really expected more from it. Yeah, I agree completely. I had the same feeling. I was really excited for her and this whole thing. I thought she'd be like dogging the Enterprise the whole way or something like that. But she really only shows up again towards the end. And yeah, very typical villain who's, you know, I don't know, just mustache twirly and and evil and wanting to destroy the Klingon Empire and all this stuff. So yeah, it felt like a bit of a squandered opportunity with her. So yeah, I I feel very much the same as you there. Okay. Well, I'm sure we'll get to more of her as we go through the book. And so now we have this troupe and they're called the Warp Speed Classic Vaudeville Company. And I remember when I read this book the first time, I thought that was really weird because, again, (laughs) I wasn't a big Star Trek fan. I really liked the movies. So I'm expecting this grand Star Trek adventure. And almost like Kirk, I'm like, really? This is about transporting the Warp Speed Classic Vaudeville Company around? Like, this doesn't sound that interesting. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was an interesting setup. But yeah, a little, little strange for sure. I do like the kind of things that you can have in a novel that you wouldn't see on screen. I like that aspect of it because they're, they've set up camp in the the hangar bay. They have this horse with wings, this genetically engineered horse, uh, an Equiraptor, I think they call her, which I thought that was yes. pretty good. And that's right. Yeah. The kind of mixing of the old world and the new world of the future. It seemed very odd, but I also liked this character, Lindy and, and her ties to the past and stuff. Yeah, I like Lindy, too. She's about 20 years old. So, and in some ways, it was a little creepy that Kirk had an interest in her. I mean, he's 30. 30 and 20, I guess. Uh, I don't know. But, yeah. But she, I, I like this character, too, because she's leading this troupe, and she's got energy, and she's very much into performing. Her dad had founded this troupe, and now she's taken it over, so she's grown up doing these performances and magic tricks and stuff. So yeah, she was a fun character. She was a nice balance to everything else that's going on of just being the normal person. That's just, you know, not a Starfleet officer, but we get to see through her eyes uh, what she's witnessing and all these adventures that they end up having. One thing I really appreciated about her was the the close up magic bit. Like that's always just been kind of a fun thing. And then her interactions with Spock on that level later on in the novel, I thought that was terrific. Spock as the straight man during a magic performance was just delightful. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, he's like calling out, you know, that's not a real coin or maybe it's a holographic coin or it's not the same coin. Like, and Kirk's like, would you be quiet? Like everybody's like, shut up. We're trying to enjoy the magic trick and you're trying to figure out what's real and what's not and everything. (laughs) But he's like, he's like actually concerned that Lindy is trying to convince people that she has special powers and belief in the supernatural. And Spock is like, I have to protect these humans from this dangerous idea that, you know, they're, they're, actual spirits and beings and this sort of thing. And they're like, no, 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 Spock. Like everybody knows it's a trick. This is just the shtick. This is just how it works. And he's like, oh, all right. If you're sure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I thought it was weird too, that they also put, uh, they, they, they found like this comet that had this debris from a cloud or something that, that they could put soil into the shuttle bay so that the horse can walk around and it's going to grow grass and all that. I had a hard time visualizing that at first. It's like, it sounds like, you know, it's just like this park now in the shuttle bay. (laughs) I just thought that was kind of funny. Yeah. I kept like picturing like moon dust, like regolith or something. And like, I couldn't picture it more as just regular soil, which is what I think they were trying to go for. But yeah, it was, it was definitely, I I feel like it would have been better if they just beamed, they just like found a planet and beamed up a bunch of topsoil or something. (laughs) Right. No, but yeah, to this point, yeah, I'm really enjoying, you know, the setup and everything in the characters, but I really want to touch on Janice Rand 
Mm-hmm. Because Absolutely. I thought this one was really interesting. I mean, she got a f- couple of good chapters mm-hmm. in this book. And so, yeah, Kirk is now the captain. He's got all this paperwork he needs to do. He's falling behind. And McCoy's telling Kirk, you know, you're the captain now. And this is a bigger starship. You can't do all this. You need a yeoman. So put in a request for a yeoman and get somebody sent up to you. So, of course, Janice Rand is sent to him. But she's just a nervous wreck. Every time she's around Kirk, she's nervous, she's scared. And Kirk's trying to, like, figure out, like, am I being too harsh, you know? And he's trying to be extra nice to her, but she keeps getting more and more nervous. And I could see that in Rand. I could see her trying to please him so much and and just stumbling, because we saw some of that in the show. Mm -hmm. I like that setup, but I kept wondering, like, okay, when is she going to, like, just calm down and chill out? Yeah, absolutely. I I was really fascinated by Rand's story in this novel because she's so different from the Rand that we see in the original series. And like, if you were to pin a word on Rand in TOS, I would say like confident when she's doing her duties anyway. She's always like taking charge of the situation, giving Kirk reports to sign, bringing coffee, doing, uh, you know, figuring out how to make coffee when all the power's down and all that stuff. Like she's very competent. But here, yeah, she's like a deer caught in the headlights half the time and very nervous. And we get some really interesting backstory from her about where she grew up and how she grew up. And the fact that she's actually younger than her records say she is and all this sort of stuff. It was really fascinating. The f- the thing I had the hardest time picturing, though, was like her short cut messy hair because <laughs> yes. it's so different from how we see her later. Yeah, I'm kind of interested as to why the author felt like she had to make her hair short. And Uhura is trying to tell her, oh, she let your hair grow out. And later in the novel, she decides, oh, I think I'll do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe it was just a a show of she's now learned that she's maturing and she's changing. So she's going to change her look to the long from the short to the long hair or something. Yeah, I think it's just like a a visual cue to her maturity and her growth, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, because she shows up on the bridge and she's all, you know, wearing this oversized uniform. She looks all messed up. She's not put together. And Kirk, you know, goes off on her like, you don't show up on the bridge looking like this. And she runs off crying. And of course, he's like, oh, there she goes crying again. And Uhura goes out after her. And that's when we start to learn her backstory being, you know, a slave and refugee. But the thing that made my jaw drop, and I didn't remember this the first time I read it, because, again, I wasn't all that familiar with Star Trek as I am now. But she's 16. Mm -hmm. And to your point, her records are wrong because it's showing her, I think, about 19 or 20. Yeah. But that's because she was on like a ship that her actual age is 16, but three years went by where she didn't age. Yeah. Because that crew was like in that time warp or whatever. Yeah, because of relativistic effects of traveling near the speed of light. Yeah. Which I loved. I was like, oh, that's real science. Like you're traveling at really high impulse instead of warp speed or something like that. I I loved that. I thought that was really cool. And you're supposed to get your records updated when that happens, you know, at your destination, but they never did that. So, yeah. And then what I thought was like, well, she doesn't look in the show like she'd be 16 or 17. And I looked up Grace Lee Whitney's age at the time and she was like 30. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm like, wow, we made her really young, you know, took shaved off 10, 15 years off of her. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I think because this is supposed to be, I'd, I'd say, probably a couple years before like we see Rand in the original series. So she'd be, I guess, 18? I don't know. That's still pretty young, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought that was an odd choice. But it works for the story. It's an interesting play mm-hmm. on her. So I thought that was it. And then she's being bullied by her roommate. And so she was able to move into her own yeoman's uh, cabin of her own. And then I kind of liked how every once in a while we'd revisit the roommate. Yeah, just like very sporadically every so often be like the adventures of of this former roommate who's being tortured now because of how she treated Rand. (laughs) Right. It was kind of fun. The green alien or something in the shower that's hogging the shower because it needs to sleep there or something. And she's, oh, I got to go somewhere else and shower. It was like, yeah, we're picking on the bully now. Yeah. (laughs) Just randomly throughout the book. And then it turns out to not be an alien, but this kind of uh, regen stuff that McCoy's been growing all book or something. That was weird. That That was was weird. weird. (laughs) 
<laughs> that was really weird, but it was fun. <laughs> I'll mm-hmm. tell you another thing that was kind of weird, and I can't wait to hear what you say about this. But Stephen, first of all, I like that name for a Vulcan. <laughs> <laughs> it still, you know, starts with an S. Yeah, it fits. Yes. Stephen. <laughs> But he's blonde, kind of has longish blonde hair, and he's looking for emotional experiences. He's all about emotion. He's the anti-Vulcan of, you know, suppressing emotions. He puts it all out there to the point that he even joins the vaudeville troupe, (laughs) the Enterprise, to perform. As a juggler. (laughs) As a juggler, right. (laughs) And he's hope, and he's like evaluating the gravity, you know, it's got to be the right gravity because if it's not, that can throw off the juggling. But what'd you think of this character? It was interesting. I would have liked to have more of an exploration of his backstory with Spock a little bit, but we do get some interesting insights. They they knew each other as youths and all this sort of stuff, and there's some family connections there of some kind, and Stephen is a disappointment. He's kind of a proto cyborg, which was interesting. That's what I was waiting to hear. <laughs> yeah, and I was kind of thinking that like in Star Trek V, they didn't have to make Cyborg Spock's brother because I think it's an interesting relationship, even if he was a childhood friend or something like that. So, you know, I was, I, I saw this as like just another way to have done that same kind of character. And I don't know which one's better. I, you know, I can't really say, but it, it's, it's interesting that it's that same idea that there's this emotional Vulcan who's kind of turned his back on the philosophy that, the rest of most of the rest of Vulcan follows and the effect that has on Spock and his reaction and stuff. Cause, because I like how you have it in the notes here. Spock can't stand him. Yeah. It's clear. Spock's just <laughs> like every time he comes into the room and Steven's there, Spock's like, Oh, I hate this guy. <laughs> yes. I, in my head, as I was reading this, I thought, man, Steven sounds a lot like Cybok. Mm-hmm. And I thought I'm going to pretend that Steven actually is Cybok. Hmm. That's Cybox's real name. He's come onto the ship, but he now goes by the name of Steven. And Spock doesn't want to admit to anybody that this is his brother. And, 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 but then I thought, well, it doesn't make sense in Star Trek V that they don't recognize him. But I'm like, well, but, you know, it's been a long time and whatever. But then they reveal that he's a distant relative. Like they explain it's like his father's brother's sister's blah 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 like they and i was like okay well he's clearly not the brother sorry i just thought of space balls now i'm your father's brother's cousin's best friend's roommate <laughs> it was just like that actually that's yeah. what it felt like yeah absolutely yeah that's so funny and then lindy falls in love with him which is funny too because kirk has a thing for Lindy and then he gets upset because Lindy likes Steven Mm -hmm. and then Kirk's almost wanting to like find ways to convince Lindy that Steven, you don't really want to be with Steven, right? I mean, come on, it's Steven. (laughs) (laughs) It felt a little high school at that point, a little bit like, okay, you know, just relax, Kirk. You don't have to get every woman (laughs) that comes along, but yeah, it, it was a little bit, Typical of Kirk, I guess, sometimes, but you have to have that aspect of his character in the story. I think my favorite Steven bit from the entire novel has to be towards the end when uh, he throws a baton towards Spock and Spock throws it back. And then they start juggling all this stuff in between them while they're having this deep conversation, including like knives and torches and all this stuff. And like they're having this, you know, deep conversation and kind of coming to terms with each other and stuff. And then Spock realizes, well, I know how to like catch all of these and and throw them back in this pattern like this. But now I'm not sure how to stop this. How how do we put these all down? (laughs) And you can see that Steven kind of sees that Spock comes to this realization and he kind of smiles a little bit. And that's the end of the scene. Like we don't see how that resolves. I love that. Uh, Just the image of Spock juggling all this stuff with this fellow Vulcan while they talk, I thought was just a great image. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of fun aspects to this story. You know, I, I kind of like that, but then we have this world ship and I didn't really remember much about this when I was reading it. Uh, But I really liked this storyline because it was a bit strange, but also felt very Star Trek. There's this huge ship it almost looks kind of like bubbles or something like that. And I mean, it's like you go in there and there's mountains and valleys and things. It's so huge and so big. But these aliens are on the ship. They fly around 
And of course, they encouraged the horse and helped the horse learn to fly because it couldn't fly because it didn't have the right gravity and stuff. But I loved how they boarded the ship. They were to, to they boarded the Enterprise. They came and they were they visited the Enterprise, and I like how this one that Kirk thought was the leader because that's the one he kept talking to. Later admits like the, the others are like, "Why aren't you talking to us?" And mm-hmm. Kirk's like, "Well, because I thought." this one's the leader and they're like leader what do you mean leader like no one leads we all do whatever we do like yeah and and there was just this implication throughout of how you can't think of these aliens the way we think like the way we do things is going to be different you can't relate how we do things onto them Mm -hmm. i did appreciate that i thought that was an interesting lesson for kirk it shows his growth as a captain right he has all these assumptions and no matter how much he says, like, oh, I'm going in without assumptions, he's, those still inform how he deals with people, this kind of idea that they have to have a hierarchy like us, that all this stuff. And I like that he eventually comes to that realization. I did feel like it took him a little while, like a little bit too long to kind of realize, like, oh, I've got to stop making all these assumptions. But at the same time, it's Kirk at the beginning of his captaincy of the Enterprise. So it makes sense that he's a little more inexperienced, a little more brash. And uh, yeah, just not really willing to shed those expectations that he has. And yeah. And then the whole communication, they can't communicate. The universal translator is not quite working right. They have these songs that how they and how they communicate. And then, of course, in classic Star Trek tropes, we have to have Spock mind meld with one of them, right? <laughs> Which kind of messes Spock up. But now we can communicate with these aliens and then even give them names because they didn't have names. And so like, oh, I'll be Scarlet because I'm red or whatever. And and then they, you know, Kirk doesn't even know their gender. And, you know, it, it's like learning about them as we go along. But I also like how Uhura is involved in helping to sing with them. And she's constantly singing and humming throughout as a way of learning and communicating with these aliens. Yeah, I really appreciated the Uhura aspect of the story. And I was getting annoyed with Kirk because Kirk was getting really annoyed with Uhura and and all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 she's doing her job. She's trying to communicate with these aliens on this level and this sort of stuff. So, you know, we, we definitely are not at the point where he trusts his crew to to, you know, do their jobs as on without kind of criticism and stuff. So we're not quite there yet, but I, I did like that. I loved that Uhura was trying to learn this speech, the whole book. And basically at the end, the aliens are like, I mean, you'll, you'll never learn it. it. Don't worry about it. It's fine. And she's kind of crestfallen, but at the same time, like she's pretty amazing that she got as far as she did. Yeah. They're like, nice try. <laughs> yeah. it's like oh aren't you cute you little kid run up run <laughs> run off you little scamp <laughs> yeah well and then we also have a situation which we mentioned earlier where scotty and kirk argue and we have this happen again and because and it this reminded me of one of the kelvin timeline movies i guess uh into darkness mm, right yeah where you know scotty leaves the ship but it didn't get to that point here, but it was starting to where, mm-hmm. you know, Kirk's like, you don't listen to me, Mr. Scott. You're just not listening. He's like, I am, I'm doing, but we have to, you know, because there was something overheard when Kirk first board the ship where Scotty was questioning his experience. Right. Yeah. And so that kind of created this little rift, but now Kirk has to leave to go over to this world ship and Spock is in sick bay. He's not his self. He has to put somebody in charge. So he puts Scotty in charge of the bridge. And Scotty's like, ah, uh, what? Nah, 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 Like, it's almost like Scotty's never expecting to ever be in command of the starship at any point, which is great because it sets up the fact that, you know, we see him do this often in the series and this is his first time. Yeah. I really appreciated the Kirk Scotty story because of, you know, where they are in their relationship. I love that it's not all cordial and that sort of thing that there is that tension there and in some ways it reminded me a bit of i think better done than this but it reminded me a bit of jellico and Riker, where they have their big falling out and he's relieved of duty and then jellico says uh i need you to fly the shuttle mission actually because you're apparently the best i don't know why that just kind of popped into my head while i was reading this but yeah similarly kirk has no one left scotty's the most senior and and you know 
has presumably some command experience of some kind. So he gets left in charge and I think really proves himself to Kirk. And I think Kirk proves himself to Scotty too, by the end that, you know, Kirk has taken these risks to rescue his crew and protect his crew. And Scotty as tempted as he was to, defy Kirk's orders and enter the fray and defend the ship and stuff. He followed Kirk's orders to the letter and backed the enterprise off. And uh, as Scotty says, he broke the orders a little bit to kind of remain in the area, but he didn't, you know, really break the rules and, and open fire. So I think he proved himself to Kirk there as well. Yeah. I love how yeah Kirk then assigns him. Don't fire. Don't do anything. Don't engage while I'm gone. And Scotty honors that. And then when Kirk gets back, he's like, I'm really like proud. I'm really glad that you did like, and all of a sudden there's this good relationship between the two. Yeah. I, I liked where it ended there and we didn't get like the, the big, huge reconciliation, but you know, it's pretty clear that it's headed in a good direction and the, these two will become really close colleagues as, as we of course see in the original series. Yeah. Well, yeah. Spock then leaves sick bay because he thinks he's like one of these beings from this other ship. And so he leaves to go to the ship and Kirk and crew and Lindy. Well, no, I'm sorry. Steven and Lindy leave the ship first to go to the word ship because Steven says to Lindy, Hey, we could get your horse to fly probably more likely over there than here. There'll be more room. The gravity would be just right. And she's like, we can't do that. And he's like, yeah, sure. We can. I've got a ship. Come on, let's go. <laughs> I was like, well, got some balls there, Steven. Come on. You're just like going to go with some alien ship. Not even asking the aliens, just assuming it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was interesting. And again, the, the people aboard the ship who aren't under Kirk's command, not completely under his authority. I like that Kirk kind of has to deal with that and has his, authority challenged a bit here i i i would have been pretty annoyed with them if i were kirk i i don't know that that's the best decision to make but in the end it does work out thankfully and they're there to help out when uh, spock is captured and then missing and all this stuff as well yeah so that of course starts the whole chain of events on the ship and then we even have Karanin, the Klingon we talked about earlier, she gets involved. She's going to come into the ship, you know, every, and then she stabs a wall, which we find out later could cause, you know, it does this little explosion. But Spock is, Stephen helps in a mind meld bring Spock back. That Spock realizes if any fighting goes on and any parts of the ship get affected in that, I mean, it could have this chain reaction and destroy hundreds of star systems. And I was a little confused. I want to go back and reread that. But it was, was it that the ship would kind of have this effect that it destroys all the star systems it had been to? Yeah. Well... Yeah, depending on which angle it got, it got hit. I don't think it necessarily was where it had been to at that point. I think it was like it would it would move very quickly away from the area and rend space on its way kind of thing. So yeah. there was a bit at the end where like if it's hit at this angle, it will destroy most of the Federation. And if it's hit at this angle, it'll destroy most of the Klingon Empire. So I think it's like the systems it would move past in that moment as it like blasts away. Yeah. And then that's not even quite the correct terminology because they determined that the ship doesn't actually move. <laughs> right. I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah. It actually moves the universe around it, which is interesting and may just be like a semantic frame of reference way of putting it, but may also be actually how it works, which is, odd <laughs> yeah it's by almost from your perspective and i mean you know are you moving or is the universe moving around you in this case it's determined that the universe really is moving that it moves the universe around it which is an interesting concept but i remember having a teacher when i was in grade school say something about you know when you're walking down the street are you moving or are you moving the earth under your feet and i was like wow Whoa. maybe i'm really moving the earth when i'm walking <laughs> <laughs> wow so yeah if if you're if you're with a date you know and she feels the earth move right <laughs> that yes. that that is you that's you that's totally you <laughs> I want to take her to my world ship. If you think that's moving, watch this. <laughs> that's so funny. 
But uh, yeah, so then we have Kirk and Karan's going to ram her ship into the world ship and Kirk's got a stopper and he's on the shuttlecraft and he comes and kind of rams her out of the way to protect the ship and everything's saved and the Klingon fleet is coming after Karanin because the guy, I think it was like his son's ship that mm-hmm. she took over. He's going for revenge to capture her. And then Kirk helps with the capture of her and the Klingons give Kirk a medal. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I love that. that. I thought that was really interesting. And definitely given Kirk's relationship with the Klingons over the course of his life, it's interesting that like his first mission as captain of the Enterprise is heralded by this uh, you know, him getting a medal, him getting set, told that he can travel within the Empire, and uh, at least for this mission, and the Enterprise is its own embassy for this mission kind of thing or something like that. And with a bunch of Klingons watching a vaudeville performance. Like, that's uh, it's interesting, given what happens later. This is uh, not where I expected that relationship to start. <laughs> I know. When this book is ending with them watching a vaudeville performance, I'm like, this really feels like something you'd see in like a, the end of a 70s TV show. Everybody comes together. <laughs> Even the enemies, they're all watching this little show and clapping. Yay! <laughs> yeah, there were shades of How Much for Just the Planet by John yes. M. Ford for me as well. Just just a little bit here. Yes, and the Klingons like this soliloquy from the uh, from uh, Coxspur that does the Shakespeare and rewrite Shakespeare stuff. That was the only thing they liked in the performance. <laughs> I kind of love how well that fits with, you know, <laughs> you've never heard Shakespeare until you've heard it in the original Klingon or something like that. Yeah. I love that. I was like waiting for them to love the Shakespeare and, you know, just thinking like, oh, that fits in so perfectly with Star Trek VI. <laughs> no, I mean, it does. It's interesting how there's things in this book that were written before other things in Star Trek that work well with the things that come later. Mm-hmm. Oh, also, I do have to say, like, as an English major, that that translation of Shakespeare was one of the worst things I've ever read. Just FYI. <laughs> oh, my. I was like, oh, this is awful. I would, like, not want to see this performed on stage. <laughs> we should have you perform that for us sometime dan oh god <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know one of the most famous shakespearean solilo- soliloquies spoken in like just modern english well i did not like that <laughs> no even they were even before when he says he rewrites shakespeare they're like why would you do that <laughs> <laughs> but but now we do find out that mitchell is better he gets a communication from mitchell but kirk doesn't tell mitchell that he's not going to be first officer, which I, I don't know if it was necessary to have that in here, but it would have been an interesting conversation. Yeah, I always wondered about that because, yeah, when we see Mitchell in Where No Man Has Gone Before, I, I would have liked to have seen kind of that bridge to that a little bit to see how we get there. But uh, it's it's kind of too bad that that's left a little bit hanging. I wonder if there was an idea for like a follow up novel to this or not, or uh, the other thing is i was thinking of the mitchell trilogy by michael jan friedman and i wonder how much this fits with that i've never read those novels so i'd I'd be curious to maybe add those to our list down the line at some point because those are ones that i've had for ages that i've never read i it's so funny you said that because i was thinking those novels too i've never read those either the my brother's keeper books or Mm -hmm. whatever it's it's i was Never read them, and I'm thinking, well, maybe that is addressed in there, and I bet it is. So, yeah, we'll have to read those sometime. Yeah, it'd be interesting to to see how well they fit together, if they do at all, or anything like that, yeah. Well, I don't think we have anything else. I mean, I'm sure there's other things we've missed, but, you know, unless you can think of something else, what are your final thoughts? Uh, final thoughts for Enterprise the First Adventure. I, I enjoyed this novel, It was not the tour de force that I was necessarily expecting. I don't know. I I didn't have many expectations going in. It's just one of those novels that gets cited a lot as, you know, an important one uh, that I've had for many years and never read. And I enjoyed it. You know, it wasn't uh, groundbreaking by any sense, but it was still fun to kind of see these characters in a different situation before we see them in the original series and how this crew kind of came together even if it doesn't completely 100% fit with what we see on screen necessarily, there's ways you can, you know, you're, you're famous for 
making up little things that kind of make it all work. And that's easily enough done, I think, with this. But it would have been nice to have it fit a little bit better. But all that aside, I enjoyed the story. I loved the absurdity of the vaudeville troupe. Uh, I loved Stephen and Spock's relationship. I thought that added something interesting to the book. But yeah, uh, I'd say a solid uh, four out of five flaming torches tossed back and forth between Stephen and Spock. <laughs> Great. He dropped the fifth one, though. So, you know, it happens. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Only Stephen or Spock could do that. <laughs> so, OK, as I'm thinking through this now. I said at the beginning of the show that I probably like this a little less than I did the first time because I know Star Trek better. But now that we've talked through it, I think it's the opposite. I think because I know Star Trek better, I think I like this better than Hmm. I did the first time. Just a little better. And there are some opportunities in here that I think are missed. As I mentioned, you know, like telling Gary Mitchell he's not first officer or seeing a conversation between Pike and Kirk and that transfer of command. I would like to see more of that. And also, like you said, like Chekhov is the night watch. I kind of thought that was fun since we don't see him in the first season, but he's there. He's just at night. So I thought that was clever, but you know, just little missed opportunities like with Sulu, like why did Kirk want him to be the helmsman? That was never really resolved. But outside of that, I enjoyed all the other things that were built on. I enjoyed seeing what they did with Rand and and the relationship between Kirk and Scotty and how they worked this in to have the Kirk, Spock, McCoy trio there without having Piper and Mitchell. And I thought it was clever how that was worked in that manner and how it works later with that episode. And then I liked the world ship. I thought it did feel very alien. I liked these aliens. They weren't aggressive or mean or anything. And it was that whole exploration piece. And there was all these little fun bits and lightheartedness and all that. So, yeah, I really enjoyed the book. But So I would say that I would give this four out of five mixed emotions that come from Steven. Oh, wow. That's that's a good rating as well, for sure. The one thing that I forgot to mention, the very last line of the book And it's kind of revealed that McCoy's recurring, I'm a doctor, not a whatever, actually came from Spock, where Spock says, well, it's clear, doctor, you're a doctor, not a magician, or something like that. (laughs) I was like, is Spock the origin of that whole phrase construction? Because that's funny. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Yeah. They had little clever things like that. That, That's what I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So in our next book club, we're going to talk about Rogue Elements, which is the new Star Trek Picard novel that focuses on Rios. And more than likely, John Jackson Miller is going to be here to discuss it with us. So stay tuned for that. Excellent. So Dan, when you are not on the Enterprise doing your magic tricks, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats, K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can also find me on youtube.com slash Kurtrats Productions. And of course, as always in my favorite hangout on the internet, which is the Positively Trek discussion group on Facebook. And I'm on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. That's Admiral and then the underline Rex. And then I'm occasionally been doing stuff on literary treks. And hopefully we'll have an episode soon here on Star Wars Report that we'll have out. I don't know what's going on over there. I keep saying that every week, but literally I have no idea what's going on. So we'll see. We'll work it all out. But thank you to our patrons for supporting us on Patreon. We can't do this without you. It helps support all the costs and efforts that we have to put into the show to make this happen for all of our listeners. So we really appreciate that. And of course, we appreciate every single one of you that listen to the podcast. And we hope you get something out of it each and every time. So the one thing we're going to leave you with is go out into the world today and stay positive.